Psalm 144. Thank you, Brother John. Psalm 144. It's a uh, kind of a unique thing. I don't know if you have had the opportunity to travel much, but um, America, I should say the United States of America, there's a big thing now that, you know, all the people coming into the country illegally, they're all Americans because they're from South America, they're from Central America, et cetera. And uh, so the United States of America, when we say America, that's what we mean. But um, there is um, this, um, it is a unique thing that uh, how we celebrate the founding of our country and a love of country is a rarity. We've had friends uh, that we know from Canada, and uh, they're, they're, um, they, they remark at how, how um, patriotic Americans are. And I find that uh, when I was in Brazil, I uh, talked to some, I talked to a lot of people, Brazilians of people uh, down in Brazil. Uh, but uh, talked to a man that was, uh, had been trained for his profession in the United States. <clears throat> and they went back to Brazil to practice. And he said he had never seen anything like it uh, when he came to the United States. He said, you know, Brazilians are not. He said the only time Brazilians are proud of their country or, or, or praise their, is, you know, around the World Cup. And it's, it's less about the country. It's more about the game. And, uh, but he was, he was remarked that he was, uh, um, in California and the man that was training him realizing he was, you know, far from home, um, had, had him over to his house and it was during baseball season. And this man was not that he was stay, that he was with was not a Christian man at all. And, uh, but at the beginning of the game when they, they, um, uh, played this, the, um, the national anthem, this man in his living room stopped what he was doing, stood, put his hand over his heart, and uh, the, uh, the man from Brazil it had never seen anything like that, that kind of love of country. So it is a kind of a rare thing um, around the world, uh, the patriotism and love of country that has been historically true in America and certainly not always or universally true. In Psalm 144, uh, we're going to back up a little bit in just a minute, but I just want to read to begin verse number 15, the last verse of the chapter. And it says, Happy is that people that in such a case, uh, that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. There's a companion verse that happens to be on our bulletin board on the side here uh, from Psalm 33, verse 12, that says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. By way of understanding the word happy in Psalm 144 and the word uh, uh, blessed in Psalm 33, both are translated from the exact same Hebrew word because the word blessed means happy. Uh, we have this idea that happiness is something different than being blessed, and it's not. If you are, listen, if there's happiness to be had, it's, at the, it's because God blesses us. And so blessed is the nation or happy is the people whose God is the Lord. And so I want to speak this morning simply on the subject of a happy nation. Father, I pray that you would help us. Lord, as I began this morning, I have recognized recently and talked about it uh, publicly a little bit, uh, you know, just concerned about my voice, my throat, and I pray that you would keep me from, uh, from it being distracting when I, if I cough. Lord, I pray that you would help me to get through the message so that your word might be heard. I pray also for those that listen and hear that you would uh, uh, help us not to be distracted 
by the, the world or the, thing, the pressures of the world, the busyness of the world. God, I pray that you would help us to think about uh, how you have blessed our nation and would continue to bless if we would but turn our hearts back to, toward you. God, I ask that you would help us to rejoice in the goodness of your hand upon us. I ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 144 Psalms, an interesting psalm. There's a lot of diversity in it. Uh, we're going to be taking a few verses from it. But uh, the, the chapter begins with, blessed be, uh, blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. The idea of, of praising God and recognizing God's blessing on us is a commonality throughout the book of Psalms. Uh, the book of Psalms, I, I also call it the parenting psalm because two, in two verses, verse 7 and 11, uh, the Bible says, deliver me uh, from strange children. Amen. And, uh, and so we, we all need to be delivered from our strange children. But, uh, and so it's the parenting psalm. But uh, that aside, there's some help for us here in this idea of a happy nation. We have been uh, being sold a bill of goods in our country for some years now that uh, the only way to be happy is to have things your way. Uh, you know, you can be whatever you want to be, however you want to uh, identify. Uh, and, you know, from, from uh, your lifestyle to the burger through the window, you got to have it your way. It's the only way to be happy. And, and, and I've often said that the key to happiness is not getting what you want. The key to happiness is learning to want what it is you have. Because if you can learn that to want what you already have, then there is no dissatisfaction, amen. There's no, there's no uh, always wanting something more and something better. And we can really want some stuff. One of the side effects of the blessings of God in our nation has been uh, that we have been a prosperous nation. But that prosperity, because of the sin nature, has fueled in us a constant desire for more of this world's goods. And it seems like there doesn't matter what it is, there's never enough. How, uh, the rich man was asked how much was enough money. He said, just a little more. And uh, it seems like there's, uh, we have this mindset that, that it is our purpose in life to slice off as big a piece of pie for ourselves as we possibly can. And it cannot be our purpose. The Apostle Paul recognized in his writings to the church of Philippi, he recognized that he got, when he got saved, God saved him for a purpose. That God had something in mind for him the day he saved him. And Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and, and pressing forward to those things which are before, my great goal, my great purpose is to figure out what God had in mind when he saved me and to achieve that purpose and achieve that goal. What is it that God had in mind for you the day he saved you? That's really what ought to be driving our life. It ought to be the, the compelling force of our life. Our country, though we have, uh, because of revisionist history, our country uh, has been derailed from its biblical foundation. Uh, it's not been that long ago that some of you would remember the uh, national battle over the Ten Commandments uh, on, you know, in courthouses, and then also the local one uh, in Duluth. And uh, I got to participate in the public debate on that, which infuriated uh, a lady on the Duluth City Council. And uh, she began pounding on the desk saying his time has to be over. He, you know, got to get this guy to, to shut up <laughs> because I was speaking about the, the, fat, the, the influence of the Word of God on our culture, and that without the Word of God, our culture would not be what it is. That our culture would be no different than any other uh, place on the planet 
that, that uh, has forsaken God or never, never uh, had God at, at the front of their, of their focus, of, of their purpose. And it is so. Uh, it, it doesn't take uh, very much work to, uh, though they're trying to erase God from our currency, from our, our public square, from our, uh, they've done it from our schools. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's amazing how, how absolutely out of their mind uh, people are because a coach has been allowed to pray on the field before a game. Not even over a loudspeaker, just to pray. Well, if we allow prayer, who knows what's going to happen next. People might actually read the Bible. Oh, heavens no, we can't have that. And so, uh, but they are, they are beside themselves. When such things were not only uh, expected in uh, the founding of our nation, but they were commonplace. Uh, you can go back and virtually every one of the founding fathers of our nation had, uh, had as public comments about the importance of God and the Word of God. And these things are foundational to a happy nation. Why? Because uh, the people whose God is the Lord, they are blessed. They are happy. I've got several quotes this morning that I printed off just for today. Uh, some names, most of the names you're very familiar with. Names like Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson said this. He said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that, he, that his justice cannot sleep forever. That quote is, man, all the way back in the late 1800s. That, uh, excuse me, uh, in uh, 1871 he said that. I tremble because if God is a God of justice, his justice cannot sleep forever. Patrick Henry said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that reason alone, people of other faiths have been afforded freedom to worship here. Isn't it amazing that the very thing that has promoted people to believe whatever they want to believe are fighting against believing in Jesus Christ. And it is only because this nation was founded on Christian principles that they're allowed to believe what they want to believe. The very thing that has given them their freedom, they want to cast aside. Abraham Lincoln, a couple of quotes from him, he said, I am profoundly engaged in reading the Bible. Take all of this book upon reason that you can, and then the balance by faith, and you will live and die a better man. He's basically saying, everything that you can figure out and understand by reason, do it. The things you can't, don't throw them away. He said, accept them by faith. You'll live and die a better man. He also said this. He said, intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on God who has never yet forsaken this favored land are still competent to adjust in the best way our present difficulty. And he said that in his day, I believe it's true today, that these things are still able, but, but what are they fighting against? What is this world fighting against? It's fighting against those very things, intelligence, patriotism, and Christianity, and a firm reliance upon God. Even John F. Kennedy, even John F. Kennedy said this, the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. You, say, you might say, well, I have, I have issues with certain uh, political figures, <clears throat> but even they have at times given uh, at least lip service, at least acknowledging the importance of God. 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, said this. He said, the foundations of our society and our government rest so much on the teachings of the Bible that it would be difficult to support them if faith in these teachings would cease to be practically universal in our country. He said, you throw away the Bible, 
and the principles that, that, that our country is founded on would be hard-pressed to support. Why? Because the precepts of the Bible were foundational to many of the laws that, that we started off with. The father of the Bill of Rights, George Mason, said this, the laws of nature are the laws of God whose authority can be super, uh, excuse me, whose authority can be superseded by no power on earth. They viewed the law of God as the supreme law. They viewed the laws of the United States and the Constitution of the United States as a reflection of the character and the design and the authority of God granted to men or delegated to men in measure. Certainly, governmental authority was never viewed as absolute because God's authority only was considered absolute. One of the signers of the Declaration of Independence that you might not be as familiar with, his name was Benjamin Rush. He said this, he said, the Bible, when not read in schools, is seldom read in any subsequent period of life. The Bible should be read in the schools in preference to all other books because it contains the greatest portion of that kind of knowledge which is calculated to produce private and public happiness. He said, look, you stop reading every other book before you stop reading the Bible because the Bible has the principles that are going to teach people to be to to have uh, uh, happiness both public and private. John Adams said this, one of my favorite quotes of John Adams. He said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate, excuse me, it is wholly inadequate to govern any other. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other than a religious and moral people. If you didn't recognize it or haven't seen it, there is, a, there is a, such a multiplication of laws trying to control the habits and the, and the uh, uh, choices of man, which used to be, well, we didn't used to have these laws. We didn't used to need these laws. And the reason we didn't used to need them is because man was controlled from his heart through the word of God. But when, they, when the world lobbied for and successfully removed the Bible from the instruction of our children as a nation, they set in motion a course of events that has, a, 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 has generations now of people that grew up without morals, without a sense of right and wrong, without a sense of authority, and thinking that every grievance they have they can they take it in their own hands to settle it. And that's exactly, and by the way, that's why, you know, the people that are trying to find a solution, they say trying to find a solution to the violence in our nation will not find it. They'll not find the solution. Why? Because they've ignored the cause. The cause is that they've kicked God out. And without God, there is no standard. Every man does that which is right, where? In his own eyes. And that's exactly where we are. There would not be children uh, at schools shooting other children if those children grew up with the kind of home that is laid out and designed in the Bible and designed by God. There is not, there is not, like the world tries to make you think, there is not uh, this over, overwhelming problem of too many guns in our country. Uh, listen, there are more, th- th- these are statistics you will not find, but you, you check it out and you, you'll bear me out. There are more homes percentage-wise today without guns than ever in our nation's history. Because when our nation was founded, every home had guns. Everyone. And so how many, how many homes didn't have guns? Zero. Because it was a staple of life. But what has changed? The heart of man has changed. Because we, because when they, uh, read Romans chapter number one. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, 
neither were thankful, and God has given them over to a reprobate mind to do the things that are not convenient. God has turned us over to our own imagination because we said we don't want God to rule over us, and so we do our own thing. And so how do we get to a happy nation? What do you say happy nation? Well, the Bible says the happy people is the, God, uh, is the people whose God is the Lord. Let's go back to Psalm 144 and let me just show you uh, three quick things, characteristics of that happy nation. Notice the beginning of the sentence is in verse number 11, one of those uh, good parenting passages. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children. Amen. Whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood. And then notice these three verses that begin with that. It's the word that, in this context, it's there to say, in order that we might have this. No, so that so that these things can be true. And so if we are delivered, then we can have these things. Notice the first one in verse number 12. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth. That our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. The first result of having a nation whose God is the Lord is that the children, uh, that the uh, children grow up and they're the kind of children that you want to have. In other words, there's strong families and strong homes. People today want to say, well, you can make a family however you want to make it. No one's ever constructed a family as well as God constructed a family. Sin, listen, I understand the entrance of sin corrupts, it corrupts everything to where. Love in a family is corrupted and it becomes selfishness. I understand that. That's true. But I, I, be that as it may, no one ever made a family like God made a family. We have the example of the divine family. You've got the God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And the love for one another, the honoring and trust for one another... Are, are immeasurable. There's, they, uh, the, the son trusts the father. The father trusts the son. Uh, the, they, the, the confidence of the Holy Spirit supports and upholds uh, the words of God the Father. He, he uh, propagates the gospel of God the Son. There's complete unity in the divine family uh, that if we walk with God and we, when we have the Bible as a centerpiece, of our, of our nation, what happens is that you have strong families. We've lost that today, by and large. If you have a strong family, thank God for it. Because sin has wreaked havoc on the, the American home and the American family. Can't tell you how many times that we've tried to be, help people that, that children, adult children haven't talked to their parents in 20 some years. That there's, there's a brokenness in the homes of, you know, between uh, siblings and between parents and children. And, and the homes are broken and the families are torn apart uh, because of sin. But happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Because God is the, if the, God is the center of the home, he holds everything together. And if we think of, if we think of a relationship between uh, people as a triangle with two people, one at the bottom, uh, 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 each corner of the triangle, and God at the top, that the closer they draw to God, they also get closer to each other. And so it should be, it's God's desire to be, for husbands and wives to draw closer together as they draw close to God, for siblings to draw closer together as they draw closer to God, for uh, a church is to draw closer together as they draw closer to God. Listen, the Bible is clear that when there's discontent, when there's contention in a church, it's because that church has become carnal. Are you not carnal and walk as men? What is absent when we, we sideline God 
is you've lost the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. A happy nation, a nation that, uh, ha- whose God is the Lord, has strong families. We need to be supportive of strong families. We need to, be, we need to encourage strong families. <clears throat> Quite a few years ago, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. Amen, three of you remembered that. When you take a drink, or when I take a drink, you say amen. Then on the recording, it doesn't sound like there's a break. We haven't practiced in a while. I remember some time back, I was trying to help a couple. They were they were having problems in their home. They were not married, and there was his kids and hers kid, her kids and their kids, and <clears throat> and I began asking them. I sit down and and I asked them. I said. Tell me about each of you. Tell me about your families, your extended family. And they began talking about their brothers, their sisters, their moms, their dads. And, oh, yeah, my sister, you know, she's been married five times. And, oh, my brother, he's married to to, uh, this person, but, but she slept with his brother. And, you know, it's like, and, and they, they described their, their family experiences. And I asked them, I said, is there one family on either side, is there one couple that is stable? And they looked at me like, what do you mean stable? I said, you know, just a a man, he married a wife, they've stayed together, and they raised their children together. And they couldn't think of one example on either side for, you know, the previous two generations of any stability. You know, that's all they've known is what they were living. That, that was the, the, the only examples they had in their life. And I said, you, you guys need to get, number one, you need to get married. Number two, you need to get in the house of God. If nothing else, just to be around some stable homes and stable families and learn by observation, learn by uh, exposure what it means to be a husband and a wife and a family. Because the way you're doing it, there's no, there's no hope of doing any better. If, <clears throat> if you have no other expectations, you have no other example, you can't see your way forward because God's not really in control of your home anyway. But that's where we live. We live in a, in a nation now where it has been generations, in some cases, it has been generations of instability in families. And if you've grown up in a stable home, if your grandparents are still married, your parents are still together, you know, uh, there's, there's a reasonable harmony in the home, you ought to thank God because it has become the rare exception instead of the rule. And it's not a credit to the individuals. The, the credit belongs to God. A happy nation has, as a nation, has strong families. Then the second result in verse number 13. It says that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. The second Result of a nation whose God is the Lord is that the, the, there's a God provided, uh, excuse me, a God blessed provision. That that nation, that nation has the opportunity to be a bountiful nation. Can I say to you, as as far short as we fall today the world is still trying to come to the United States of America. Uh, Sometimes, don't you just want to shake these political or social leaders that want to just talk about how bad things are in America and what a terrible people we are, etc. I'm like, uh, you know, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Because in every, uh, on every border of our country, are lines of people willing to <clears throat> do whatever it takes to get into our country. 
Show me the lines of people trying to break out of our country. There's nobody trying to break out. You want to leave? Go ahead and leave. But nobody, you know, as much as people talk about if so and so gets elected, I'm leaving the country. I'm still waiting. Because they know they couldn't shoot their mouth off like they do in any other country. They'd be arrested. The truth of the matter is, and and by the way, it's that way not because, not because of our character. It's because God blessed this nation. This nation was founded as a place where the word of God could be preached, the gospel could be preached, and people could follow their, their conscience, follow God according to their conscience. And because of that, God poured out his blessings on this country. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed, amen. We've had the blessings of God. Our garners have been full. It is a crazy thing. I don't understand maybe all the politics of it. Maybe I've, maybe I've got too much common sense to understand the politics of it. But we pay farmers not to grow food. You say, well, there's a reason for that. Okay, well, that's fine. I, I, you know, I've heard some of the arguments, but we're paying farmers not to grow food. It just, it's craziness. The, the truth of the matter is, if you unleashed this nation, it could feed the world. Our, our political leaders tie the hands of our nation for, I think, for, for crazy reasons, but that's, that's just me. Um, but I would say this. There's not a nation on the earth that has been blessed like the United States in its history. Now, <clears throat> you might say, well, yeah, but the nation of Israel. Listen, the nation of Israel is God's chosen people. <clears throat> but if we're going to talk about anything with modern history, you can't compare to how God has blessed the United States of America. I do believe that, that God is, uh, is going to protect the nation of Israel, that the nation of Israel has become very prosperous, but in its history, there's nothing like what God has done in the United States. There's no comparison. Why? Because happy is the people whose God is the Lord. And then look at the third one in verse number 14. The first thing is a happy nation, the nation whose God is the Lord, has strong families. The nation whose God is the Lord has a God-blessed provision and supply. And then number, number three here, verse number 14, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in or going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Well, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? You can't go to Walmart without, you know, overhearing this person, that person complain, 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 complain. Listen, the worst that people here have it is still better than the best most in most other places in the world. That's just the honest truth of it. Uh, But we've lost sight of how good God is. Uh, the, uh, so, <clears throat> so, number three, the nation whose God is the Lord has satisfying labor. In other words, we, the work of our hand, God blesses it, God provides for our needs through it, and the Bible ta- talks about Bible principles. If a man won't work, he ought not eat. But if we'll put our hand to the plow, if we work, uh, uh, work the labor that God has given us to do, our meat is satisfying. We're, we're glad of it and grateful for it. And most of us, if we're honest about it, have more than we really need to have. Oh, listen. Could we all use more? All of us would like more. Amen. Amen. All of us would like more. But the truth of the matter is, if we're not careful, we get focused on the possessions of this world and we forget that when God has blessed us above what we need, he has a purpose for that extra. 
that he desires, that the Bible talks about the working, the work, that the, the labor that God has given us, that we might have to give to those who have need, to be a blessing to other people. You know, there's a couple of things that happen when we become selfish and self-centered. Not only do we end up having more than we need, we end up robbing. You know, sometimes God's channel of blessing is supposed to flow through you. <clears throat> and when it doesn't, then someone else is coming up short. God has, God gives you sometimes things that he wants to be, you to be a blessing to somebody else. And when we close up that, that uh, avenue, we're hoarding it to ourselves. We become very self-centered. But when we labor as God would have us to, and he blesses that labor, the oxen are strong to labor. There's no breaking out or, 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 or breaking in or going out. Nobody's breaking in to steal what you have. No one uh, going out looking for what other people have. There, there's no complaining in our streets. There's a satisfied, satisfied labor that when we labor and God blesses us, we, we are grateful for it and satisfied with it. You say, well, it's a lot easier to be satisfied when you have more. Maybe. But people are very often dissatisfied the more they have. There's a, I don't remember the, the, the reference in the book of Proverbs. I, I, I should have looked it up. It just popped into my head, though. There's a reference in the book of Proverbs where it talks about that those that are rich can't sleep because they're worried about somebody taking what they have. Just, just that concern over possessions instead of pillowing our head comfortable in the knowledge that God has provided for us. You know... <clears throat> Um, for many years, Mrs. Wagon Sheets and I, uh, we drove cars that, we never had car payment. We drove cars that, that God gave us. And, uh, and, and it was, you know, we, we often did not drive what we wanted. But we were always driving what God wanted us to have. And there was, there was uh, I mean, there's some interesting vehicles uh, that, that we drove, and uh, we have nicknames for some, some of them. But we got where we needed to go. And, and you know, there's, there's something about learning to be satisfied with what God has provided. That, that you look at that and say, you know what? Uh, we might have thought we didn't have enough. We might have thought we needed better. But we got where we were supposed to go most of the time. Except when I was out of town, Ms. Wang, she would always break down. And that's what the deacons of the church were for. To, to come break her, you know, fix, get her car off the road or break into the house because she locked herself out. That was, a, that was the two things. The deacons had to, you know, be able to break in the house, get the car off the road. And so if you couldn't do that, we couldn't be a deacon here. <laughs> but how often we look back at those things and say, boy, you know, uh, at the time you thought, how are we going to get by this? Or how are we going to survive this? But you look back and you say, God brought us through. You see, the people whose God is the Lord, they have a satisfying labor. That, that when, uh, when they've worked, they've prayed, and God has provided, it is enough. Oh, listen, we've come a long way from that as a nation. But it doesn't mean we have to be far from that as Christians. Amen? Because I want you to notice something here. I mean, in Psalm 33, it says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Here in Psalm 144, it just says, The people, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Whatever group of people. You know, as a church, we can be a people whose God is the Lord. And as a people, we can have strong families. We can have a God-blessed provision. And we have a satisfying labor. As a family, you can have these things as well. But it's going to have to be that God is your Lord. Just real quick, let me give you this thought, ask you this question and give you this thought about, in a summary. What does it mean whose God is the Lord? Well, the Lord is obviously referencing 
the God of heaven. And he's saying, if your God, you see, you can have a lot of different gods, but if your God is the Lord, if your God is not the world, if your God is not, you know, your own pocketbook, if your God is not uh, your own desires, but your God is the Lord, you can have these things. Why? Because having, having the Lord as your God puts the rest of the world into perspective. Whose God is the Lord. And think about that phrase. Is the Lord my God? I didn't say, is he God? Is he your God? Is he the driving force of your life? Is, are the principles of the word of God? I, I got a text this morning from a pastor asking about one of the Proverbs. About... Uh, what do you think this means in the book of Proverbs? And I was able to, to you know, go back and pull up the devotion that God gave me on the book of Proverbs, that, on that chat, on those verses, send them to him. And, and just say, look, this is what I know. This is what God showed me from that passage of Scripture. Prison ministry it's, that God has opened up for us recently. It's, it's, it's all about just saying, look, this is what God has given, that God has to be in control. God has to be, that, that God has a purpose for your life. I was sharing with prisoners yesterday. I said, you know, God's purpose for your life does not start when you get out of prison. God's purpose for your life started the, the moment you got saved. So my question is, are you doing what God wants you to do right now? Listen, we don't even have those restraints in our life. Are you a blessed people? Is the Lord your God? Or do we need to adjust our life away from the mindset of the world and back to the principles of the word of God? Have we started being assimilated into the world and its thought process? Or is is God still guiding our life? Father, I pray that you would help us, not just as a nation, but as a church and as a people, as families, that we would recognize the importance of having you be our God. There are many lesser gods, small g gods in, in this world, people that worship other things. But there is no God like our God. And we are blessed, we are happy, if you are our God. Why? Because you give us a strong family. You provide for our needs. And you give satisfaction to our labors. We are satisfied. We are at peace. God, I pray that each one here would be able to say, as best I know how, I'm following God in my life and in our family. It's the way to be blessed or be happy. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed as we stand.